Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood, a podcast that's all about changing the way we view midlife and bringing the conversation about menopause out into the open. Each week we share stories, experiences, tips and inspirations. We talk to experts on how to best navigate this time of life and how to have as much fun as we can. Now here's your host, Karen O'Connor. I'm here today with Erica Bowen, who is a psychologist, a coach, and imagineer of the Hope Makers. Now, I met Erica because I was looking for somebody who could talk, come on the podcast and talk about toxic relationships. Is there a way that people can spot somebody who's toxic? Is that obvious? Or is it mainly from the outside we go, oh, yeah, that's not... It's so, nice. it's so interesting because you always get groups that will say, you know, if you've got a high profile, because, oh, well, clearly, you know, when you look at his characteristics, it was clear that this was going to happen this way. Hindsight is 2020 vision. And it's so, so hard because what we know is that we get these things, you know, called illusory correlations where we look in, in anything and we assume that these two things are linked and therefore forecastable or predictable. Risk assessment is really hard and it's not an exact science. Even when you're using kind of scientifically derived tools it's not easy and it's not always right and like I said you know what we do know is that a woman's perception of the likelihood of her being re-abused is as accurate as standard risk assessment tools so you know the first thing that we could be doing is is speaking with and, and at least believing the women who are saying that they're it's they're scared because the likelihood is they are and with good reason <laughs> you know that's what we know I think there are characteristics of toxic relationships and some of those patterns are around people kind of like moving in together really, really quickly. You suddenly go, wow, you've only been together like two weeks and now you're living together. That's really interesting because what's driven that. And sometimes it's completely innocuous. And this is the other thing is that from an outside perspective, you can also over, over assume risk where there is none because you're not in the relationship, you know, and that's, that's a difficult dynamic. But when you look at kind of like characteristics of abusive relationships, sometimes, you know, a pattern is that men tend to be quite a few years older than the women. There is that a, quite an interesting age disparity. Um, but yeah, it's that sense of things moving very, very quickly, you know, moving in together very, very quickly. A man becoming very much part of a woman's life very deeply, very quickly would be something that I would be kind of going, that's okay, that's interesting. What, what is that actually about? Because it's not usually the way relationships work, you know? And it doesn't have, you know, again, it can, it can exist and not be abusive either. Um, and I think that's, a, you know, a real difficult one. I think the moment that somebody's behavior seems to change once they're in a new relationship. So if they are, wearing different things that they would you know wouldn't normally wear or if they are talking about being given permission to do things in any way shape or form was like, oh yeah no he, he told me it was fine for me to come you'd be like okay that's interesting because actually why you know do we need to give each other permission yes you can say you know i'm going out tonight I, is it okay if i go out tonight is an interesting question because why wouldn't it be okay if you're in an equal and loving relationship being, yeah, you know, it's fine. You, you know, you have some level of independence from me. So I think where there seems to be a high level of dependence very quickly in a relationship, or that seeming to be what the case is, you can maybe think and just go, okay, that's interesting. Maybe I need to, to keep watch a little. And sometimes most of the time it will be nothing. And sometimes it will be something. And that's the real difficulty from being an observer. But yeah, if you notice that somebody who was deeply sociable has a very strange change of mood or presence, you know, their energy changes dramatically if they seem more guarded, but they're not really saying anything and maintaining that everything's fine, you know, but actually you can tell something is going on, then it's probably worth asking those questions. And it might not be that, but something is going on. I think it's about following your gut because... A lot of the time we will pick up, particularly with people that we know, those really subtle changes. And it could be that they are dismissed and, you know, and all the likelihood is they will be dismissed because would they want to, would anybody want to acknowledge the fact that actually their relationship isn't really working out the way they want it to, or they're being made to feel as they're going crazy, or they don't actually feel safe, 
you know, that requires a huge level of vulnerability, which most people aren't happy with. And the likelihood is you probably won't get an opportunity to be one to one with them because of any form of controlling behavior, because what you'll probably find is they become more and more difficult to reach as a friend. And if that starts to happen, then again, I would be thinking, okay, that's interesting. Yes, friendships fluctuate over time, but it's only been since he was around or she was around. So it it can be very, very subtle. Going back to what you were saying about um, the risk analysis and the women Mm. who come out of it usually um, can say really accurately Mm. how much they're at risk or not. Is implication behind that that those women aren't believed or is is the cases of that where they've gone no I'm really at risk and the risk analysis has come up back that no they should be okay I think it's it's an, an interesting field so what we have so if, if for example in that situation they would be women who are probably going to be involving the criminal justice system so other professionals that requires the professionals to understand the dynamics of domestic abuse okay so whilst we have in the UK a one kind of main risk assessment that's used by the police. I've conducted research with the police where they tend to go by their gut and override the risk assessment anyway, which is interesting, but actually not necessarily in that way because they're terrified of the repercussions. So if they get it wrong, you know, they would much rather say something was at greater risk than lower risk because if they get it wrong, somebody could die. So the the police tend to understand the severity potentially of domestic abuse. However, Domestic abuse is usually defined as a pattern of behaviour. And what you have is a response from the police that is incident based. So unless there is really good data collection and really good recording, then that pattern of behaviour, which is there, can be missed. The other difficulty is that at any particular scene of crime, you have two people. And again, what you have is a woman and a man, and the man will likely be behaving in such a way that will make it seem as though the woman was the aggressor. That happens quite a lot. So there's the situational manipulation from the get-go, if they know that the police are present. And one of the most difficult things for police to do is to work out who actually is the aggressor. Now, you could say, well, let's take, you know, take a, an educated guess, one in three women are victims, so let's go with the fact that it's the man that's the aggressor. But they obviously also then have to go by the evidence that's presented at the scene because they need to then meet the legal requirements of evidence. So, again, everything that we would think rationally when it comes down to those procedures may not play out because of the way the scene looks, the evidence that's presented at the scene. So that all of that can then impact on professional perceptions of risk. And also, if you're doing a risk assessment with a victim at that point, she's going to be deeply distressed she will possibly still have the abusive person in the room, you know? So those dynamics are not going to be potentially as reliable as if she was being interviewed somewhere else where they were separate, where she felt safe. Why would they interview her with the perpetrator still in the room? Um, Sometimes just simply because of the pressure of the scene, because they're trying to work out what's going on. Right. You know, and, and, and that's, that is the difficulty, you know, and, Every police officer I've spoken to finds domestic abuse cases the, the most challenging, but they also make up about 60% of the police casework. So it's, you know, and they also can be, they can be lethal situations as well, also placing the police at risk. So the risk in that situation when they go to arrest isn't just about the man and the woman potentially that's there, it's about actually the risk to the police as well. So, you know, and invariably, a high proportion of those cases in this situation will also be alcohol or drug influenced as well, which then adds a layer of unpredictability to things. So, you know, it's just that kind of, yeah, a horrific scenario where you've got lots and lots of layers of risk, not just the risk to the woman, but actually the risk to the police officers, risk to the perpetrator potentially to himself by himself. So all of those dynamics that have to be assessed and managed within a situation. I couldn't do it. I, there's absolutely no way I could be a police officer working around that dynamic because I think whichever way you work, you probably feel that you're going to get something wrong because there's so much to try and control and understand in a really dynamic and very, very difficult situation. But it does mean that invariably there are judgments made that are incorrect because it's not straightforward. 
you know, at, at all. The police have been, certainly in the UK over the last few years, there's been a lot of kind of reviews of, of police procedures and things have certainly been changing to try and make police responses better. But certainly a few years ago, there were some very, very damaging uh, reviews of police responses to domestic abuse because of the lack of, of attention to detail, the, the lack of awareness of actually trying to get that information to, to, to meet the legal requirements of the definition of domestic abuse, as it were. Um, and I think we've still got some way to go on that, but you've also got you know, some incredible domestic violence spe uh, specialist officers as well who do an in incredible job. So it's, yeah, I think it's probably one of the most difficult crimes for police to be involved in because of the nature of the dynamics, the people involved, the fact that actually a lot of the time women will get call the police out, not because they want their partner to be arrested, but just because they want it to stop now. They want this thing, this incident to be stopped. And of course, what you then have is the police response, which is, well, if we're called out, we're here to gather evidence to try and prosecute. But if victims have no other way of trying to control their, the person that's controlling them, then that's also not going to work either because their use of the police is not the intended use for the police, as it were. You know, that's not the role that they want the police to act in. And we don't have an intermediary. We don't have any other kind of agency that can kind of come out in that role. So you then have, again, a, a quite a big disjoint between what victims potentially want from, a, from, a, from an incident as an outcome and what the police are expected to do as an outcome of an incident. And that, again, that can lead to certainly variations in reporting and expectations and, and all other sorts of things about people's perceptions of the policing of domestic abuse as well because it's not necessarily working in the same way that it would for any other form of crime. I hadn't even considered that, that the police are law enforcers and it's the yes. only way to stop this, but they go in with a mandate to enforce mm -hmm. the law. Yes. And, it's, and yet most of the time it might not be a law enforcement issue as such. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. We know that the, the, the rates of prosecution for domestic violence are very small. Um, you know, even smaller for rape. But for domestic abuse, I think, you know, the dynamics around the policing of it are very, very different for exactly that reason, because women are trying to gain power in a situation and an incident at that moment where they feel most at, at risk, not using it because they want their partner to be prosecuted or go to prison. Because again, all of the other stuff, because they're dependent on their partner in some way. They have kids. They don't want to disrupt the family. You know, we still we have layers of moral reasoning that are still there within all of this. You know, people still want to have a family. They still want to have a family life. They still want to have a semblance of a united family, even within the context of abuse. And all of this can still play into decisions of whether or not they're going to prosecute, whether or not they want to take it forward. But again, from an outsider's perspective, we would go, for God's sake, you called the police, just get him taken away, you know. Why, why, why on earth would you want him back in your family home? It's like, because it's, it's the dynamic of family, which, you know, is so very different to any other social configuration we have you know, as, as a species. It really is, you know. So, yeah, I keep, I keep saying it. It's, it's very complicated. It really is. You know, there are so many layers to it and so many reasons why people will or will not stay in an abusive relationship. But it's, it's easy to understand why we all as outsiders get frustrated by it, but that's simply because we're just not in it, you know? And the best thing we can do is to keep watch, you know, because even if there is a period where any wrongdoing is denied or, you know, it's everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. You can see as a friend, something's not fine. Then the worst thing we can do as a friend is to then start believing that everything's fine. And go, okay, I can see that it's not fine, but you say it's fine. That's all, you know, and kind of distance ourselves because actually what we need to do is to be there should we need, should we be needed and to be there and go, okay, yeah, I'm here. I, you know, and if you need me to help, I can help without your friend, associate feeling they're also going to be judged by you because of the way things have gone for them, you know? So it's, it is hard, but you know, you do, you have to be, I think, mindful of the fact that this stuff can happen and it can happen regardless of your level of income 
we know, you know, particularly when financial abuse is involved, there can be incredibly wealthy families where abuse is really at the center of the family dynamic. Um, and again, if you've got a man with high levels of financial resources, when it goes to court, we know who's going to win. Or conversely, you know, you know, money speaks an awful lot to power. So that's always going to be part of the outcome in those kind of things is going to be the level of financial resourcing available to whichever party. But it can happen regardless of who you are. You know, it's indiscriminate. It's not about wealth. It's not about not having money. It's about human experience and what drives that need to control somebody. And a lot of that can come down to some very deep seated insecurity. Some of it can come down to having seen stuff like that modeled as a kid. You know, you learn how to treat other people by how you were treated and how you see other people being treated around you. It's usually a combination of many, many things. And sometimes as a psychologist, we'll put people in boxes and go, oh, it's because of a personality disorder. That in, in a very small minority of cases, that may well play a role. Most of it is a function of socialization and trauma. So, you know, it's, it's learned either directly through trauma or indirectly by other stuff that you've seen and the expectations that have been shaped for you by the people that you've been around. I want to ask some more questions, but I'm just looking at the time. We've been talking for an hour. We oh, have. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. I told you this is good. This is going to be good. Um, yeah, I better wrap it up because <laughs> my podcasts are usually 40 minutes and I've just still got about three more questions I want to ask, but I can't. So, you can ask them if you want to. I'm, I have time. What? I always get quite cross when I hear mm. a news report and it says, mm. you know, there was a car crash, two people died, but two people are uninjured. Mm. No, they're not. <laughs> they cannot possibly come out of no. a car crash uninjured. No. How no. much of this has to do with the uh, the only thing we see as being important is physical health oh, and well-being? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's really interesting. So in the UK, we've had some legislation passed around a concept called co coercive control. That is to try and foreground the insidious psychological damage that can be caused by overtly controlling behaviour. It's still, I was going to say relatively new, <laughs> it's been around a few years now. But in terms of prosecutions, we've had very, very few. Again, so it's, it's that kind of similar thing to kind of stalking. So if you have somebody who is pursuing somebody else, and it could be after the end of a relationship, it could not, but they will have a certain dynamic between them where there is stuff that is known and is of significance between them and only them. If you imagine in a relationship, you know, you'll, you have a certain level of, of deep understanding of each other's behaviors, patterns, past, whatever it is, likes and dislikes. So if you are pursuing someone and causing psychological damage, what you can do is then use all of that knowledge against them. For example, leaving a box of eggs outside the front door, if you know that for whatever reason, somebody is, for example, is allergic to eggs or has yeah, had a traumatic incident in the past that involved eggs or you know just something that was deeply significant to them, but to a passerby, you'd look and go, it's a box of eggs, for God's sake, you know, what, how can that be of any significance to you? Whereas you, what you've got is what seems like a deep overreaction to the presence of this thing. And that's the difficulty is that actually that meaning is very, very individual, but it's also deeply, deeply meaningful. So, you know, it is a really extraordinary trigger that nobody else can understand. Now, that's the way that psychological abuse works. You know, it's just picking up on the triggers and what is known that can be used and turned against you. And what that can then lead to are then other erratic patterns of behavior in the victim that people don't understand and will try and probably attribute to something else other than it being a product of domestic abuse or coercive control or stalking and harassment, whichever way that is. So it is very, very difficult to, to deal with something like that. And I think particularly within a legal framework, you know, it's very easy to find evidence around physical violence. You know, if there's a bruise, it's easy to see. If there are, you know, unfortunately, any other form of wounding is easy to at least see that there has been an incident that's occurred. 
even though we know that when those incidents are viewed as individual incidents, it will decrease the likelihood of domestic abuse being recorded <laughs> because again, it's just working at an instant basis. But then when you have something that doesn't have a physical presentation, it's much more difficult to detect and much easier to describe as something else. So we do have a very clear bias towards things that are easy to understand, i.e. physical violence, wounding, yeah, those really clear signals where we can't can't get it wrong. The situation over here at the moment, one of our high level politicians, our former mm. attorney general, he was kind of moved sideways a couple of right. weeks or so ago. He's been accused of raping somebody when mm. they were at a debating contest when they were 17. So we're talking a long time ago. She's actually committed suicide. But now more and more women are coming forward right with stories of how he's behaved. So there was an incident a few years ago. It wasn't him. It was somebody else, another MP in federal parliament. Somebody, one woman got up out of a chair and this guy went over and sniffed the chair that she just got up out of. No. Wow. Okay. That to me is the exact coercive control that you're talking about. There's, there's a pattern of behavior there that is meant to instigate an outcome of the women need to be kept in their place and yeah whatever else is going on in their minds sure. and it's interesting how difficult the politicians are finding it to actually do anything about it it's really fascinating it it, it always is fascinating I think I think it's Again, I mean, if you think about the level of power that he has, the positions of authority that he's been in, the implicit fear that the women would have had ever experienced because of that. You know, there's a lot of silencing that happens that doesn't even have to be said. And that's without his then overt behaviours. But I think it always is very, very difficult for people to know where to start with people in those positions. I think, I think the response globally is, is changing. I think we are more ready to take it on. But I think there is still so much more to do. So much more to do in getting to a position where we just get that these behaviours are wrong and, and we don't do them. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's so it seems so easy to say, doesn't it? But um, I think it's taken a long time for people to validate women and then to validate women's experiences is is another step <laughs> that we still need to take without being labelled as being, you know, histrionic or yeah all of all of the other nonsense that we've grown up with but when you have somebody in a position of power like that and the other difficulty is then the other people that have seen those behaviors and said nothing that's you know? one of the things that's coming out now is yeah. there was a woman who was raped in parliament in one of the female mp's offices and she, wow, it was okay. reported to the police um, by a staffer. She was raped by mm -hmm. she was a staffer and, and raped by this other guy. It was reported to police and basically quashed. It, they were told yeah. to mind their own business. This was about eighteen months ago, and then she went public again a few months ago, a few weeks ago. And more and more women are coming forward and saying the same yeah. things happened to me, and I got shunted sideways. So they're starting to do something about it. But Good. we've got a long way to go, yeah. especially when our Prime Minister, ScoMo, the Australians are, are not very deferential, they call him ScoMo, Scott Morrison. Yeah. He, his first comment was, in, in the comment was, well, I spoke to my wife about it. Why would you need to talk to your wife? Oh, my word. It's so interesting, isn't it? How, how people talk and the things they say. And you think, OK, so if we're going to find a moral compass, we know where to look. Your wife. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's it is so interesting, isn't it? And I think, and I think this is again, it, it becomes part of the challenge is that the language that we use is, can be so dismissive, and that's fundamentally how we communicate. So if we get our language wrong, then actually what that does is also silence other people because that comment does not invite people to come forward. It does not enable them to think oh that's fine if I've got an issue I can come forward and I'll be believed because actually he felt the need to defer to his wife so that means that inside himself is what it's a question you know and but it's all of that signaling and I think that's why again it's so so difficult that it's not just a kind of an individual thing it's not just a family thing societally we need to start getting our messaging right we need to start talking about it in a way that enables people to feel they'll come forward and be heard and respected for their experience and clearly 
part of the, the challenge around all this is that if it then becomes a criminal matter, then it then becomes about finding the evidence. And that doesn't always work in a way that is respectful of experience because it's trying to work out if the experience was there. And that, again, is just a completely different perspective than than trying to go, we acknowledge your experience because the investigation will go, well, we don't even know if your experience happened. and We need proof that it did. And that's completely different. We'd better wrap it up on that note. Okay. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about what you do now. What I do now. God, what do I do now? So I'm a (laughs) coach. Play the cello. (laughs) (laughs) No, so I'm a coaching psychologist. So I've kind of gone from being working more forensically to now working in a coaching space, which for me is, I, I actually just love it because it's very future and very positive focused. And you can imagine after working in the field of domestic abuse for 20 years, it can take its toll. And I felt the need to just do something that spoke more to my personal values. And for me, I've always been about trying, you know, that, that whimsical notion of trying to make the world a better place. That's why the research I did as a, for my PhD captivated me so much because it was the potential to do that. It was that kind of, if I do this piece of research well, then victims will be better served whatever the outcome because if the program works great if it doesn't great then at least we know and we can try and do something different so for me I think you know the beauty of the pandemic was I got locked down for a year (laughs) and and took time to uh to really evaluate what I wanted and I knew things that were feeling a little off for me within my academic role and I had trained as a coach I brought coaching more into my workplace which was you know was a great thing to do But what I really needed was the ability to work with people more directly. And so I left academia at the end of last year um, and set up my own coaching business. So I do coaching and consultancy. I'd still do consultancy around domestic abuse because after 20 years, it's it's a difficult thing to completely break away from. And also it's so much of of who I am. You know, it would be ridiculous to go, oh, no, I'm not talking about it or, or working or consulting around those things. But I needed to find a kind of a positive balance to go with that. And so from my work, working as an academic in in violence prevention, I'd worked a lot with other nonprofits, with third sector organisations. And one of my first coaching clients was somebody who led one of the organisations I'd worked, I'd partnered with years ago. And that was kind of what led me into coaching that group. And it was so lovely because they kind of found me really, rather than me having to think, oh, I need to work out who I'm going to work with. And I think because I share very, very similar values, you know, all of those organizations still work on the basis that they're trying to make the world a better place. And I fundamentally get that. But I also understand that actually doing that can be, A, it's tireless. It's sometimes thankless. It can put you in some very, very difficult positions. But also if you're leading that, the likelihood is that you are probably sacrificing a little bit of yourself along the way, but are unaware of it. So for me, I work in the space of going, okay, well, let's make sure that you have the impact that you want, but we're going to do that by making sure that you're looking after yourself and that you have the kind of the the emotional, psychological and coaching support to be able to be effective in your role, but also to make sure that you're prioritizing your own needs. Because if you don't, there will be no role, there will be no impact. (laughs) For me, it's it's kind of that straightforward. We don't want you to burn out because if you've burnt out, you've gone and we can't have you not be here. So... So yeah, so that's kind of what I do now. And how can people get in touch with you? So they can get in touch with me. Probably easiest way is through my website, which is www.thehopemakers.co.uk. Um, I have a contact form through there, or they can email me at erica at thehopemakers.co.uk. Thank you so much for today. It's been an <laughs> absolute joy. I love it. Time. Thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> And thanks for being so open because it is a topic that isn't, it's being spoken about more, but it's not something that, it's not a happy topic, shall we say. I think that's the best way of putting it. No, it's not. And I think, you know, people are so, it's one of those topics people don't know how to talk about. And even when I speak, I sit there and go, oh God, you know, I can remember from my academic life, you know, there are so many tensions within the field and, and arguments and debates about causes and all that kind of stuff that um, it can be really difficult to, to feel as though you actually can say anything because you feel that you're going to be shouted over. So clearly there will be somebody that comes back and will be like, oh, you got that wrong or whatever. And I'm like, it's born on 20 years of experience. So, you know, we'll see. But it's, it's not a straightforward thing to talk about. It's really not. And it's not a straightforward 
issue and it's complex and damaging you know so it's hugely hugely important that we do something about it but also I think you know we're also a little bit scared to be innovative in that space too because of the risk of doing something new that's unproven as well so we need innovation we need new ideas we need new responses but that always has to be managed against against risk too well we don't like getting things wrong either do we We no we don't to getting things wrong we don't we really, really are. Yeah. And, and, you know, quite rightly so. We don't want to do things that we know, in, you know, intentionally do things that we know are likely to fail. That, that would be ludicrous. But, you know, we do need to start to, I think, think a little bit differently. You know, just a small step away from where we currently are, that are grounded in a safe place, but just a little bit different to see if we can start changing things. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Stay on the line because I'll, t- I'll just say goodbye and then, and then I'll... Oh say goodbye thank you so much that was absolutely brilliant erica i really appreciate your time oh no it's been great (laughs) thanks for joining us this week on menopause marriage and motherhood make sure you subscribe to the show on your favorite player and while you're at it we'd love you to leave us a rating on itunes or just tell a friend about the show that would be amazing too be sure to tune in next week for the next episode And remember, if you're busy thinking about what you can't have, how on earth are you going to enjoy what you can have?